All right, so this title is called The Feast, uh, with an S, Feast of Jesus, or Jesus' Feast, with an S. But we're not going to talk about Tabernacle, Pentecost, Passover, you know, those feasts. And that'd be another good study, and I'll probably do that in an adult Sunday school sometime of going through the feast. These are parables that Jesus gave about some feast that happened. So Luke 14, we're going to go 1 through 11. And it came to pass, as he went into the house of the chief Pharisees to eat bread on the Sabbath day, that they watched him. And behold, there was a certain man before him which had the dropsy. And Jesus answering spake unto the lawyers and Pharisees, saying, Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath day? And they held their peace, and he took him and healed him and let him go. And answered them, saying, Which of you have an ass or an ox falleth into a pit and will not straightway pull him out on the Sabbath day? So Jesus was a personal preacher, and he said, Which of you? And I'm sure he made eye contact with these fairies. Which of you doesn't go out and do that, knowing that a few of them probably did it that morning <laughs> or last week? It's always in their face. In their face preaching is the way to go. Verse 6. And they could not answer him. Uh, answer him again for uh, to these things. And he put forth a parable to them which were bidden, when he marked how they chose out the chief rooms, saying unto them, When thou art bidden of any man to a wedding, sit not down in the highest room, lest a more honorable man than thou be bidden of him. And he that bade thee and him come and say to thee, Give this man place, and thou begin with shame to take the lowest room. And when thou art bidden, go, uh, but when thou art bidden, go and sit down in the lowest room, that when he that bade thee cometh, he may say unto thee, Friend, go up higher, and then thou shalt have worship in the presence of them that sit at meat with him. For whosoever exalteth himself shall be abased, and he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. So you go back, and then verse 8, you'll notice a line there that says, Lest a more honorable man than thou be bidden of him. Some men are more honorable than others. And he said, They're more honorable, give them the better, the better place. No one's born that way. It's not an aristocracy, the king's son. They're honorable because they do honorable things. They have character. And it should, proves out over time that they go, oh, elder so-and-so came and he's more honorable. Put him on the front row. Put him here. Put him there. And he's like, I'm giving you some practical events. Some of you guys think you're all that in the bag of chips. He's like, no, you're going to be embarrassed for everybody. They're going to say, no, sit in the back. You didn't get kicked out of the wedding. But sit, sit in the back, you're, you're, I don't know why you thought you are the honored guest. Why, why would you think that? Go, go to the back. So he's telling them these things. And then he gives the punchline, verse 11. Whosoever exalted himself shall be abased. And that's publicly abased. And he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. If you, uh, you, know, you don't exalt yourself, uh, you, you want to humble yourself. If you don't humble yourself, God will humble you in due time. This has happened to me before. I much prefer to humble myself than for God to humble me. And I'm very thankful when God humbles me because when God humbles me, then that means he still loves me because the Bible says, as I love, I rebuke and I chasten. So I go, okay, well, I'm still getting smacked by God and cleaned up and fixed. This is great, and you should welcome that. But it's a lot better if you just humble yourself. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you just save yourself a lot of pain and headache and circles around the mountain. Um, let's talk a little bit more about this honorable Honor, uh, go to uh, keep your finger there. I'm going to read Luke the whole time. So, First uh, Corinthians 12. First Corinthians 12:17. Uh, if the whole body were an eye, uh, where were the hearing? If the whole body were hearing, where were the smelling? But now. Uh, hath God set the members, every one of them in the body, as it hath pleased him. 19. And if they were all one member, where were the body? But now are they many members, yet but one body. 
And the eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of thee, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of thee. So we all need each other. The pastor can't say to the people, I don't have need of ye. No, we need the feet. We need the women cooking. We, we need the kids in the choir. We need the preaching. We need the signs. We need each other. We are a body. It is not a one-man show. 22. Nay, much more those members of the body which seem to be more feeble are necessary. So they seem to be more feeble. They're the more necessary ones. <laughs> yeah, let that sink in. And those members of the body which we think to be less honorable. There's that word honor. We think that they're less honorable. All, all they do is you know, clean the church afterwards or do the dishes or this or that or hold the sign or hold the camera. We think less honorable. Upon these we bestow more abundant honor and our comely parts have more abundant comeliness for our comely parts have no need. You know, your calling parts have no need. So he's like, well, they, they, don't, they don't need that. Pa the pastor doesn't need a compliment. I, I know if I preach kind of an off sermon, bad sermon, but I don't, I don't think I, uh, not a best sermon, I'll phrase it that way. I, I'm going to be honest, I don't think I ever preach a bad sermon because I'm preaching theology and theonomy. I may have preached some false doctrine five years ago, but I, and, and a sermon that may not be the top sermon. Okay, you know, if you, if you examine yourself, you go, okay, uh, you know, that was like, oh, it was all right. And so... But if it's a good sermon, you know, so the, the more calmly, and it's not just the pastor, it could be any other position, any other thing. It's like, they have no need. But the other parts of the body need to know, no, you are needed as a faithful child in the church. You are, you are needed as a faithful woman in the church. You are needed as a faithful man in the, in the, in the, in the bigger picture in the church. Every part of the body. Uh, 24. Uh, for our comely parts have no need, but God hath tempered the body together, having given more abundant honor to that part which lacketh. Sounds to me like some people have more abundant honor. You may not see it in earth. In fact, you probably won't see it in earth. I'll bet you'll see it in heaven. You'll, you'll see it in heaven. I think you'll see some of it. You'll see snippets in earth. You'll see parts of that and, and you know, and, 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 and everything. And so, um, um, it says more abundant honor right there in your Bible. 25. That they should be, uh, that there should be no schism in the body, but that the members should have the same care one for another. And whether one member suffer, all the members suffer with it. Or if one member be honored, all the members rejoice with it. Now ye are the body of Christ and members in particular. Okay, so go back to... Um, to um, Luke 14. So there is different levels of honor. And like I said, the guy wasn't kicked out of the wedding. He just was publicly put to the back of the room. That would, that would just, you know, be like some new guy visit the church. And then he just tries to sit where my wife sits, right there. The seat of honor next to the pastor, right there. And it's like, hey, I'm like, what are you doing? Uh, James, put a chair back there by the water fountain for Brother West, please. Put him back there. Yes, thank you. Okay. <laughs> you know, I was like, well, what is going on? Like, why would you possibly think that? I've street preached three months. Okay. All right. That's great. Go to the back back there and see if you can listen for three months. Let's see if let's see that. All right. Moving on. Twelve to fourteen. If he's trolling me, then I'll know because he'll email me because then he's still watching the sermons. Maybe I'll see. Maybe I get to rebuke him Wednesday at at, at court. Don't post this until after Wednesday. <laughs> New Jersey. Jokers. 12 to 14. Then said he also to him that bade him, When thou makest a dinner or a supper, call not thy friends, nor thy brethren, neither thy kinsmen, nor thy rich neighbors, lest they also bid thee again, and a recompense be made thee. But when thou makest a feast, call the poor, the maimed, the lame, the blind, and thou shalt be blessed, for they cannot recompense thee, for thou shalt be recompensed at the, at the resurrection of the just. Okay, everyone say this. Say, overarching principle. Overarching principle. And say this. Not doctrine. Not doctrine. If this was doctrine, you cannot have dinner with your kinsmen. <laughs> 
It says, not with the kinsmen. No, no, don't do that. Not with thy friends. <laughs> no, sorry, Brother Levi. But doctrine says we can't have fried dinner with friends. I got to go hang with the crackheads again. Invite them over. My wife's going to cook for all the crackheads tonight. This is a good overarching principle. Absolutely. This is in the Bible. We are to do that. We do do that. We buy them some food at times after outreach. Come out. I'll get a burger with you now. We've done that many times with people that have prayed. If they pray. And they gotta, they got to take a knee on the concrete or the grass. Like, I, I want to know. I want to know. And then sometimes I have a guy follow me like 50 feet in a crazy crowd. I follow me down the block. And, and then we got over there. I said, ow. I was like, follow your mace, honey. I said, now, you want to take a knee? And, uh, and we're going to pray together. I'll take it with you, man. He said, yeah, I'll pray. We, we're, we're bound to pray. You know, and then he went to one preacher back. So it happens all the time. But then I bought him a burger. That's the point. So, and then that dude couldn't give anything back. He's like, ex crackhead. I'm probably back on crack now. Crack is whack. Don't forget that, kids. And so, uh, this is an overarching principle. This is not saying we're going to get all the, all the heroin addicts from Pottstown to our house. They can visit the physical building and visit the church, you know, and, and other things like that. But um, just being able to do things for some people when they can't do anything back for you. Okay, they have no ability to do anything back for you as all. Well. And, you know, and this context is primarily about inviting people to repent of their sins and get saved. You're going to see the context. That's what this big invitation is. Hey, I'm inviting you to the marriage supper of the Lamb, the feast of the Lamb, to get saved. That is the context here. And, um, and uh, you know, it's, it's also about these, these raw sinners, and we invite the raw sinners. It's not about the, you know, Pharisees or the professing Christians or these, or these hypocrites. Okay, this is an important lesson. This is an important scripture I'm about to give you. This is not about these professing Christians and hypocrites. Let's keep your finger there. 1 Corinthians 5, 9. The Bible says to deal with them differently. They say they know Christ and they do not depart from feminism. They say they know Christ and they do not depart from lukewarmness. They say they know Christ and they do not depart from churches that close in COVID. 1 Corinthians 5, 9 says, I wrote unto you an epistle uh, not to company with fornicators, yet not altogether with the fornicators of this world or with the covetous or extortioners or with idolaters, for then must ye needs go out of the world. He's like, you're going to have to die if you're going to think you're never going to be around a sinner, a fornicator, a covetous person. You wouldn't even know how to have a job. There's all, they're all over the place. You, you, you'd have to, must needs be, you'd have to go out of the world. So when he said in his epistle, uh, uh, there's either three or four total epistles of Corinthians, uh, but the other ones weren't scripture. As he wrote in another epistle, this is proof right here, verse 9. I wrote unto you in an epistle. Uh, this is 1 Corinthians. So therefore, there was a, one before that. Not scripture. Don't read it as it is. I don't, I, don't, I don't read any of the Jasher books or any of, the, any of those other stuff. You haven't read your Bible ten times. You've got no reason to be reading that, that stuff. It's not scripture. Anyways, he said not those fornicators. And here's he explains it at 11. But now I have written unto you not to keep company if any man, I don't know, I'd say woman, any man or woman that is called a brother, that is called a Christian, that is called a sister, be a fornicator or covetous or idolater or a railer or a drunkard or an extortioner with such a one no not to eat. For what have I to do to judge them also that are without? Do not ye judge them that are within? Question mark. He's saying, you need to be judging the people in the church. Are they really saved or not? Are they on that list? And that is not a complete list. Absolutely not. That list is all of 1 Corinthians 6, 9, and 10. All of Revelation 21, 8. All of Galatians 5 list. There's a lot of lists. So this is not the complete list at all. And he's like, you need to judge them that are within. Verse 13. But them that are without, God judgeth. Therefore, put away from among yourselves that wicked person. And the reason they're, it says those that are without God judges, but they're already under the wrath of God, John 3, 18. They're condemned already because they believe not in the Son of God, as Jesus is God. So, already condemned. so that's why they're judged without. We go and tell them. Within, you have to judge, because how else would you know who to eat with or not? Mm -hmm. I do not eat with my stepdad. 
who raised me for six years, who later divorced my mom, has nothing to do with their divorce. I told him, are you going to stop calling yourself a Christian because you're a drunkard, a glutton, and probably a whoremonger now, and maybe an adulterer, I don't know. But I know some months, I pointed out his sins because I know his sins. And his answer is, no one's perfect, what about your past, blah, 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 all the normal standard stuff. And he's like, so I'm coming out to New York, and we see the girls, because he was the grandpa. And I said, no. I said, I'll eat with you one time, because I want to share the Bible with you. So I'll eat them to preach with them. I'm, I'm not going to, I'm not going to, I said, you stop calling yourself a Christian, that's totally different. No, I am, I'm saved, I'm going to heaven, blah, blah, blah. What about those fags? Oh, why are you going to call them fags? Why do you call them homosexual? Oh, it's your little fag defender too, huh? So I just get, I got the next level, the next thing. And finally, he called me Pastor Satan, you know? And so, so these things escalate if they don't get saved. And this is a clear scripture of what you should be doing with people that are calling themselves a brother or a sister. Back to Luke. So the Feast of Jesus. This was about raw sinners that we just read up to verse um, 14. It was about raw sinners. It wasn't about the Pharisees and the hypocrites. So this is all in your Bible because those goats will affect you. And if you happen to be a strong, grounded man, man, those goats will affect your wife and kids. It might not affect you. They'll affect them, the weaker vessel, the children whose minds are susceptible. They, they will do that, and it's just a matter of time. It's not if. Are they infected in three months, six months, two, two days? I don't know. That's all it comes down to. And so this is why my family does not join homeschool co-ops. We don't join the homeschool co-ops. I mean, it'd be great. I'd love to have the kids have 20 other kids around five, but I know that they're infection. I know they're false doctrine and they're goat gospel. I understand those things. And I've seen the fruit of it over and over again in many homeschool you know, groups. So that's, that's why. Right there. All right, moving on, 15 to 18. And one of them that sat at meat with him heard these things. He said unto him, Blessed is he that shall eat bread in the kingdom of God. Then said he unto him, A certain man made a great supper and bade many, and sent his servant at supper time to say to them that were bidden, Come, for all things are now ready. And they all with one consent began to make excuse. The first said unto him, I have bought a piece of ground. I, I, I bought six acres. I, I got this piece of ground now. And I must needs go and see it. I pray thee have me excused. Or I'm broke, so I can't ever go preach. Or I can't go preach because I've got to do this or do that. No, we'll just be poorer and, and preach. I preach with money, and I preach when I'm poor, and I preach when I'm middle class, and I preach when I'm flat broke, and I preach when I'm money in the bank. I, I, I got to preach. I'm a preacher. But this, isn't, but this guy's making excuses. Jesus didn't chase him. He let him make an excuse. You're going to see how Jesus handled all this. You're going to, so we're going to read the whole chapter today. Uh, 19. And another said, I have bought five yoke of oxen, and I must prove them. I pray thee have me excused. And yes, you do need to prove some oxen. You buy, is this horse going to buck my daughter off and kill her? Break your neck, or we're gonna prove this thing. I, you know, we gotta prove some things. I get that, but not at the expense of your soul or doing the Lord's will. Not at that expense. I will not work Sundays. Not a chance. Break God's law blatantly, presumptuously. No way. Uh, Twenty. And another said, "I have married a wife, and therefore I cannot come." You know, that's one of two reasons, but it still falls on the man either way. Is that the one, the woman's guilt trip, you're going to be arrested like Pastor Aiden, you're going to, you're going to get you know, killed, you're going to have this. Her fear transfers onto him. He's kind of manly. He's kind of, and then he folds because really she wears the pants. Or he just folds right off the back because he's just like, hey, I'm married wife. I can't come. It's got nothing to do with her. She would have been like, go ahead, go serve the Lord, whatever. That even brings it up. It's like, I can't, I can't. So it's one of those two things. Either way, it falls on him. Um, 20. So that servant came and shewed his Lord these things. Then the master of the house, being angry. And you can put, underline that if you want. Mad! Mad as heaven! Not mad as hell. Hell's not mad. Hell has no, hell has no feelings. Mad as heaven. He's angry. He said unto his servant, Go out quickly into the streets and lanes of the city, and bring in hither the poor, and the maimed, and the halt, and the blind. 
And the servant said, Lord, it is done as thou hast commanded, and yet there is room. There's a lot of room in heaven. Technically, heaven can hold all 8 billion people. All 8, 80 billion if there's that, if the Lord tarries, but um, most don't want to get saved. They like their sin. They like being their own autonomous, want to be autonomous person with their own law system. That's why they're right, will bow later to prove that their law system bows to God's law system. <laughs> that he is the superior one. No matter what they had, an autonomous they thought they had. And uh, they're going to be in hell forever. 23. And the Lord said unto the servant, Go out into the highways and hedges and compel them to come in, that my house may be filled. This is about heaven. Compel them. Pers knowing they're for the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. If they're still standing around, I'm still preaching them. I'm going to try to persuade them until 4.30 in the afternoon when it's time to go eat some dinner. If I've been there since 12 to 4.30, four and a half hours persuade. I'll chase them. They can walk off anytime they want. I'm going to try to persuade those ones that are there in front of me. And if they're reprobate, I just try to persuade them to kill themselves because they're useless. Mm -hmm. And that's not mean. That's very gracious and merciful to the children that would have been molested by them later. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, we, we talked about that last week. Um, how far am I reading now? I'll read the whole chapter, but where am I stopping at? 24. Oh, 24. For I say unto you, that none of those men which were bidden shall taste of my supper. None of those men, none of those women are going to go to heaven. None of them that were bidden won't come. Most of you Jews aren't going to go to heaven. You're going to hell. Because you didn't submit to the Lord Jesus, the King of the Jews. 25. And there went great multitudes with them, and he turned and said to them, Wow, we just read some pretty hard preaching. And like the multitudes are still sticking around. They might still stick around with some hard preaching. The multitudes are still there. We're like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You verbally abuse me some more, Jesus. You know, Bible thump me some more. I want more. Okay. All right, well, then we're going to have to take it up a level so you, you can really understand what the love of God is and what this means. And it doesn't get any stronger than 26, 27. If any man come to me and hate not his father and mother and wife and children and brethren and sisters, yea, and his own life, he cannot, cannot be my disciple. And whosoever doth not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. So obviously I love my wife, my girls, and family. The point is you love Jesus that much more. And women, you love Jesus that much more than your husband. That much more than your children. So if any of you, then you, you, you have him first in your heart and your life. Because that's who you bow to on Judgment Day. That's what determines you go to heaven or hell. And then he says in 27, Whosoever doth not bear his cross. See, everybody has their own cross. You don't have my cross. I don't have your cross. God has custom crosses to break us into his image. So there's certain things you go, whoa, this, that. Yeah, okay. So everybody has their cross, so you carry their cross. And the only way to carry their cross is by the grace of God. That's it. And like, well, Lord, I need, I need your help. Like, you know, I need your help. Help me carry this cross. You wouldn't give me more than I could bear. Help me, help me to flow. Help me to do that. And, of course, this one really spoke to me as I'm, Wanting to build on the land. 28 to 33, for which of you, intending to build a tower, sitteth not down first and counteth the cost, whether he have sufficient to finish it? Amen. Very practical, Jesus. Very practical. What's the budget? What's the budget going to come out? Less happily after he hath laid the foundation and is not able to finish it, all that behold it begin to mock. Now, of course, I'm thinking of land and a fifth wheel and a little road, and I, and, I, and I get that. I'd be out in the woods so far, nobody could see it and mock. This is also about like, oh, I thought, I thought you were going to plant a church in Philly, and you just quit. No, nah, we're going to go. We're going to make this foundation deeper and stronger and raise up children that aren't afraid to call a faggot a fag and a lesbo dyke a lesbo dyke. Amen? Amen. And so they want to mock. They're waiting for the failure. They'll jump on it in two seconds and it, it, quick. Uh, uh, 31. Or what king going to make war against another king sitteth not down first and consulteth whether he be able with 10,000 to meet him that cometh against him with 20,000. 
Notice it didn't say that he automatically said, oh, I'm, I think I doubled my numbers, I quit. <laughs> I'm automatically going to, he goes, huh. Now, if we attack at night like Abraham did, and then God anoints us here, and then we have our Calvary had charged twice, which was Oliver Cromwell's genius general idea that nobody ever did. They would just charge through once on a horse and then just be done for the day and the infantry try He turned right around and went back a second and threw them all off, and they won the battles. <laughs> you know, he was so aggressive as a general. Puritan warrior general, one of my heroes. And uh, and uh, so he's like, we might be able to or not, we can get some counsel, you know. The pastor doesn't know it all, I'm not a general, so we need some counsel, we need some warrior tactics, and we're gonna figure out if we can do this. What man would possibly make war and not do that analysis? Hello, that's way more than building a building on six acres, way more. 32, or else while the other is yet a great way off, he sendeth in an envisage, that's like an ambassador, and desire conditions of peace. Mm -hmm. Hey, if we surrender, can I still keep my kingdom, my crown? Hey, if we surrender, 20% tax or 30, what, what do you want? He's like, this idiot. Like, what is he possibly declaring war? And then all of a sudden he saw all these tall giants come out and these other guys. I don't care if our enemies have bazookas, nukes, this, that, whatever. I don't care if it's skinheads, Muslims, and Tifas combined together. I don't care if it's three versus 3,000. I don't care. I would rather fight to the death than be ruled by another tyrant. And we're ruled by tyrants right now, and pedophiles, and people that switch laws and jack things up. And when you watch this January 6th documentary tonight, you're going to be even more mad. And, and you used to say, like, oh, well, you, you know, well, you didn't fight, we're outnumbered. But, hey, God knocks this country down with nukes. This is our, this is our chance to rise up and get, and get things set straight. There's no, there's no way I'm not doing anything. Oliver Cromwell on steroids. He didn't have an AR-15. 33. So likewise, whosoever he be of you that forsaketh not all that he hath, he cannot be my disciple. Salt is good, but if the salt have lost his savor, wherewith shall it be seasoned? It is neither fit for the land, nor yet for the dunghill, uh, that kids, that's poop hill. That's their, that's their, that's their poop pot, the big pile of poop. The salt isn't even good for that. But men cast it out. He that hath ears to hear, let him hear. And so you women might know this. I had to look this up about some facts about the salt. Uh, pure salt contained correctly never goes bad. Pure salt that's fully pure contained correctly never hundreds of years goes bad. Table salt is not pure salt. Pure salt's black. Okay? It's the pure salt. Two things make it go bad. One is uh, additives. Table salt has additives. It's ionized. Ionized, ionizing, whatever. It helps bring it together. So additives, which it, it is added, and it does eventually make it go bad. So if things are being added to your uh, gospel, added to your uh, brain pattern, added to your word, Traditions of man, traditions of fake churches. And the second that would be known as leaven. The Bible says, sit not in the council of the ungodly. Then the second thing that would make salt go bad is a bad storage that absorbs humidity. Um, the humidity will eventually evaporate all the salt and leave behind it a substance that looks exactly like salt, but doesn't taste like salt at all. But it looks exactly like it because it's in a bad storage, a bad environment. And so... Jesus' listeners knew this about salt, and they had piles of salt that they would throw down on the pathway that would go up to the temple, the sacrifice. And that's all it was good for, was to be trodden under foot of men. That's all it was good for, like they salt the road in the wintertime. Okay? But it's not good for the ground, like my pathway. I thought of a, a road I'm going to build in, uh, in, in the wilderness there, and it's like, no, it's not fit for the land. It's neither fit for the land, nor yet for the dunghill. For this, uh, no, it's just for the spot that's already you know, got down. And uh, so bad additives, bad storage, messes it up. And in one case, the bad storage, it makes it look exactly like salt still until mm. you actually taste it. And uh, then, then, you, then you would know. And so this clearly teaches against one saved, always saved. Because, you know, the Bible says have salt in yourself. And I am the salt of the world. You're the salt of the world. Well, Jesus is the salt. But he says, you are the salt of the world. Have salt in yourself. 
And if you have no salt, you're trampling in front of me. So clearly there's no such thing as one saved, uh, one saved, always saved. And he who has ears to hear, well, those that are bid to the marriage supper of the Lamb, and that, 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 that love God more than they love anything else, more than their own life, more than other things, and it will cost you. And it will cost you. And it is worth it. One last note here on salt before wrapping up. Oh, no, I have another. I have one more feast to cover. Um, there is a taste disorder, like uh, like a, well, you get spiritually, like false teaching and having itching ears to itch, itch your ears or what you feed upon. There is an actual taste disorder, and it made me think of uh, when my wife got COVID and her taste buds are messed up. But there's another taste disorder that causes the loss of the ability to taste food properly, and it also causes them to their taste buds to receive very high saltiness flavor when there isn't salt in there. You take a bite of something regular, a banana, you're like, whoa, filled with salt, ah. And it's a taste uh, dis disorder. And basically what I'm saying is uh, if somebody backslides, my message won't sound salty to you anymore. It's gonna sound like hate speech to you. It's gonna sound like some control Pharisee, whatever, to you. Because your taste buds are messed up on what you've been feeding on, and when the salt of the word comes and, and this is going down, then they're like, no, you can't taste right. You can't hear it right. And obviously we know the other scripture that messed up spiritual taste buds is like messed up hearing. Be careful how you hear what you hear. What filter is it coming through? Discipleship is wanting the best uh, with no, for other people with no ulterior motive. Just want the best for them. Just want them to go to heaven when they die. Just want them to live holy on the way there. Just want the kids to be good Christian kids, good Christian young adults, good Christian adults. Thinking 20 years out. And so that is an actual real taste disorder. And one last feast parable. Go to Matthew 22, 11. Matthew 22, 11 to 15. And you know, the Lord just cooked me. Uh, yeah, obviously I've had some bad sermons. I take that back right. The ones with, the, uh, the, with some of the false doctrine uh, the first couple years of past training, God's probably like, I hate that sermon. <laughs> so uh, clearly I've had a few bad ones. Uh, so uh, Matthew 22, 11. Thank you, Jesus. Uh, and when the king came to see the guest, he saw there was a man which had not on a wedding garment. And he saith unto him, Friend, how camest thou in hither, not having a wedding garment? And he was speechless. The Bible says their mouths will be shut. We talk about every knee will bow, every tongue confess. Their mouth will be shut. They will have no excuse or argument. They, they will look, see a holy God on throne, and they will go, I am guilty, guilty, guilty. You are Lord. Besides you are Lord, their mouth will be shut. This guy was speechless. He thought he had on the right clothes. He thought he had the garment of Christ. He thought he was invited to the wedding. And look what God does to this fool. 13. Then said the king to the servants, Bind him hand and foot, and take him away, and cast him into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth, for many are called, but few are chosen. Oh, he called those Jews to get saved, and they didn't call, they didn't answer it, and so they most of the Jews went to hell. And they knew that was talking about them, because look at 15. Then went the Pharisees and took counsel how they mountain tangle him in this talk. He knew he was, those guys weren't stupid. They knew Jesus was talking about them. We must be clothed in God's righteousness. And if we are clothed in his white righteousness, we will walk in his footsteps. And if if you stumble, you must. Repent quickly and get new, pure garments from God. Because it won't come from your self-righteousness. It won't come from your doing right after. It's only going to come from Jesus clothing you in his pure white garments again. And then you would say, I don't want to make this dirty again. Revelation 19.5. scripture. Let's read about this marriage supper of the Lamb. Let's read about heaven a little bit. 
they just got done singing a great song about God's righteous judgments, of killing bad guys and avenging his servants. And in verse 5, and a voice came out of the throne, the throne, didn't say three thrones, not two thrones, one throne, saying, Praise our God, all ye his servants, and ye that fear him, both small and great. And I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude, and as the voice of many waters, and as the voice of mighty thunderings, saying, Hallelujah, for the Lord God omnipotent reigneth. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him. For the marriage of the Lamb is come, and his wife hath made herself ready. That's walking on that straight and narrow. Remember, Jesus is the door. His blood gets you into heaven. You walk on the straight and narrow. The man proposes to the woman. Uh, Levi, James, y'all propose to your wife? Okay, y'all propose? Okay, so the initiation came from the man. Okay, I propose to my wife. The initiation came from the man. And then it says the wife hath made herself ready. What if she ran off and just slept with a bunch of dudes while you're engaged? Obviously, you don't marry them. So you can go through the door, be washed in the blood of Jesus, get off that straight and narrow, be a whore to God who died for you, and end up going straight to hell and deserving it. And we talk about hell a lot, but you're going to miss the marriage supper of the Lamb. You're going to miss heaven. All the tears are gone. All the... All the other things. I got babies in heaven waiting for me. Miscarriage. Dead. They're alive and they died on earth. They're alive in heaven right now. I may have a few family members. I may have my grandma Evelyn. I don't know if she got baptized when she got you know, saved or not. It was a Pentecostal church that I went to, so she probably got baptized. And uh, you know, she sewed into my Bible school. She had other fruits. I mean, she didn't get saved until like 65 or 75 years old. So it's not, you know. So as harsh as I am, I'm not expecting as much on a 65-year-old grandma going to say, like, why weren't you at Mardi Gras? <laughs> you know, like that. I mean, the fruit that I, that I, I, I know how to measure fruit. And I'm like, well, I mean, it's the same like that. And I'm not, trust me, I'm not being biased. My grandpa's in hell. My dad's in hell. Although my brother's going to hell. I get this. So I'm not, like, I'm like, well, I mean, she, she, she never missed a church service. But I don't know if she got baptized. I don't know. Um, anyways, we got people in front of us in heaven. All the sickness is gone. All the tears are wiped away. All the struggle is gone. All the confusion is gone. All the strife is gone. It's going to be awesome. You don't want to miss it. You don't, you don't want to miss it. So, that, so uh, verse 7, and, and his wife hath made herself ready, and to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white. For the fine linen is the righteousness of saints. And he saith unto me, Right, blessed are they, which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he saith unto me, These are the true sayings of God. You've been called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. You didn't turn real quickly. You've been called to it. You just have to answer the call and continue on the straight and narrow. Every head bowed.